Scottish medical student James Younger Simpson was brash, precocious and deeply ambitious. In 1827, aged only 16, he attended his first operation, surgery to remove a breast. With no painkillers, the only thing her surgeon could offer the woman was speed. Simpson found the whole experience so horrific that for a while he gave up medicine. But it also made him think about the importance of pain relief. And then in 1846, he receives the momentous news. A dentist in Boston called William Morton has performed the first painless surgery using a substance called ether. Simpson tried out ether on his patients and soon discovered it was effective. But it had problems. This is a bottle of ether, and it's quite, it's quite unpleasant. It's quite pungent, and I better not sniff too much of it, otherwise I'm going to pass it out on the ground. Uh, it was originally made by mixing alcohol with sulfuric acid, and people used to, unbelievably enough, drink it at parties. Now, it was an extremely effective anaesthetic, but it had one big drawback, which I think, Andrew, you're going to show us. Yes, indeed. It's a nice spray of this stuff. <laughs> wow. See why it's a drawback, because if you're in the operating theatre and presumably they were gas lit at that time, Absolutely. you knock over a bottle of ether, suddenly everybody loses their shirts, yes. literally. <laughs> as well as being explosive and pungent, ether irritated patients' throats and made them thrash about. Not what you want in delicate surgery. So the opportunity was still there to find a better anaesthetic. In 1847, while sniffing chemicals at home, Simpson stumbled on chloroform. Simpson himself didn't actually discover chloroform. That had been done 15 years earlier by Dr Samuel Guthrie. He, for reasons best known to himself, mixed together two gallons of whiskey with a couple of pounds of chlorinated lime, put them together and then fed this substance to his daughter. She took a sip, declared it quite delicious and then passed out. He decided to market it as a stimulant and never realised that, in fact, it was an anaesthetic. And so there you are, there's chloroform. Fantastic, thank you. I think give it a little sniff. It's actually much nicer, much, much nicer than ether. It's got a sort of fruity nose to it, and I can see why Simpson and his friends enjoyed it so much. Actually, I can begin to feel, I'm not sure it's suggestion, but I am beginning to feel some sort of effect. Thank you. I think I might hand this one back. There's actually a bit of an after kick to this, isn't there? Simpson successfully used chloroform on a few patients. And then, with the zeal for self-promotion, worthy of a 21st century marketing man, announced his stupendous findings to the medical world. Simpson gave a talk to a group of interested doctors. He extolled the virtues of chloroform, and at the end, he got out a handkerchief and a bottle, and he asked them if any of them fancied giving it a try. Soon, great hilarity ensued, as men fell unconscious to the ground, while others wandered around in a state of great intoxication. Fortunately for the men who were unconscious, they all woke up. Others, however, who were to try chloroform would not be so lucky. Fanned by Simpson's enthusiasm, chloroform became widely used. And as that happened, patients began to die. First a handful, then a dozen, then in their hundreds. Simpson refused to believe there was anything seriously wrong or investigate what was causing the death. But until someone did that, the bodies would keep piling up. Dr John Snow, today best known for proving that cholera is waterborne, soon became intrigued by the chloroform death. He looked into the autopsy reports and noticed the victims had certain things in common. 
the people who died were on the whole young, fit or fearful. So what on earth was going on? This is now an ad agency, but 150 years ago it was Snow's home and the place where he did many of his chloroform experiments. Snow was cool, analytical. He carefully studied, measured and calculated. He looks at case after case after case after case, looking for the pattern. He tabulates, he records, he turns things into statistics. Snow studies subjects to death. In his own time and at his own expense, Snow measured the exact quantity of chloroform in the dead bodies. And he experimented using chloroform on animals. Snow soon discovered that chloroform can badly damage the heart. That's because chloroform reduces the rate at which every cell in the body works. It acts particularly fast on brain cells, so it knocks you out. But chloroform can also slow heart cells, and too much will make them stop. Chloroform is actually an extremely dangerous drug. Just a third of a teaspoon is enough to knock you out. Half a teaspoon, enough to kill you. So that explained part of the mystery, why the young and the fit died. They needed a higher dose to knock them out, and the higher dose pushed them much closer to the fatal dose. But why did it matter if you were fearful? Snow realised that they were the ones who were struggling, holding their breath for as long as possible. Eventually, they'd take an enormous gasp and inhale enough chloroform to stop their hearts. Splashing spoonfuls onto a handkerchief and putting that on the patient's face was clearly not a great technique. To reduce the risk of overdose, Snow invented one of these things. It's a chloroform inhaler. What you do is you pour the chloroform in here, then warm it up with the hands so it creates a vapour. The vapour comes up through a tube and into a mask. Much, much safer than splashing some of it onto a handkerchief. Snow administered chloroform to over 4,000 people, including Queen Victoria, without a single death. Thanks to John Snow, chloroform became a much safer drug and went on being used well into the 20th century. Snow is a particular form of genius. He creates a strong sense of medicine as a research project. And in that respect, he's the founder of a new idea of what medicine is. Back in Scotland, Simpson and his career were unaffected by Snow's devastating criticism. Simpson refused to accept that chloroform was inherently dangerous. When he died in 1870, he was a national hero and had a huge state funeral, the largest in Scottish history. Flags flew at half-mast and 30,000 mourners lined the streets. The bombastic Simpson brought chloroform to the attention of the world, but it was Snow who made it safe. Simpson has statues and memorials, hospitals named after him. All Snow has is a small grave, a plaque and a pub. But his legacy lives on.